This program is proudly brought to you by Telecom Limited and Daytech. Good night, Papua New Guinea. I'm Malcolm Waira, and welcome to In Focus. In this session, we hold discussions with ACNOW. We examine some of the major development challenges facing PNG and its respective advocacy initiatives. Joining us for discussions is Mr. Eddie Tanago, Campaign Manager for ACNOW. Eddie, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, firstly, Eddie, ECNA wants to build a help build a better PNG where the national goals and directive principles in our constitution guides our development as we intended to at independence. How far off have we strayed? Our constitution, the constitution, our preambles, and the five national goals and directive principles should be our development yardstick. It should be used as a measure of our development pathways. Now, we as a country have actually gone astray. Unlike today where we have so many Sabeman and Sabemeria, we have PhD holders who are Papua New Guineans, accountants, lawyers, whatsoever you call them. Under the sun we have now for, as Papua New Guineans. Back then, remember, we had only a few elites. And I always say that what our forefathers have drafted, that with the intention of having it as our development path for the country back then was based on wisdom. It was wisdom that made them to have come up with a document. Um, you know, they said that, uh, and it's quite clear in the Constitutional Planning Report or the CPC report, that Papua New Guinea should be a country and its economy should be driven by agriculture. One that is based on the land, one that is centered around the people. Unfortunately, it's close to 50 years now, and we have gone astray. We have tried to dance to the rhythm of the outside music. We wanted to be part of the global society. We wanted to be part of the race. We wanted to, you know, contribute to this bigger globalization. We wanted to be part of it. And that has sort of made us gone astray. Um, we have actually lost focus. Our forefathers, as I said, have already foresaw, have already saw the future of Papua New Guinea. Now, after independence coming down, we have our leaders or the young ones who decided to change the goalpost from one that is land-based and agriculture-based to one that is now that we follow, that is resource extractive-based. We started to open doors to outsiders with the intent that the resource extraction would be our development path, one that will drive our economy. That saw us opening more mines. That saw us giving license to too many foreign-owned logging companies. That saw us having so many fisheries come inside and harvesting all our fish. They saw us, that saw us having all kinds of development activities that are happening now, all with the intent of driving the economy. Now the question we ask, or we should all be asking, and we as an organization as well to ask is that, where are we now? After 40 years, we should be well off. We are seeing that has been repeatedly done and done and done all over again in the last 40 years. We have been doing the same thing, expecting a different result, even though nothing has really transpired into the lives of Papua New Guineans. And the evidences and the examples are numerous. We talk about foreign reserves. We're supposed to have more foreign reserves because we have more mines that are operating in the country. We have more logging companies. We're supposed to have more foreign reserves. We're supposed to have our oil and gas that are uh, produced within the country. 
So we don't have to go and buy what's ours from outside again. So in a way, we keep money within the economy. And there's also the danger of having the economy to be run by outsiders because monies are not kept within Papua New Guinea. The bank accounts are kept also. It's only operational funds that have been brought into the country, only a few. So that means that more foreign reserves are going outside than coming in. So as a country, we have actually gone astray. Now, land is a very sensitive topic of which your organization has been heavily engaged in the advocacy for the protection of especially customary land. Yeah. How would you describe the state of affairs within the land sector in PNG? Land is an important asset for Papua New Guineans. And when I say land, I mean customary land. It has been under threat for numerous times, and it is still now. And part of our campaign is to promote customary land. We say that the narrative we try to push is that land is something for Papua New Guineans that we see as our sustenance, our identity, our bank account. If you have, in a foreign context, if you have a lot of money in your account, you are secured. For Papua New Guineans like you and I, when we have so much land within our grasp and within our hands, we are secured. That's it. Whether you like it or not, you live in the cities. When you die, your body of yours will be put in the land that you never went and visited or claimed as yours. So you see how the importance of land to us. Right now, it's under threat from, as I said earlier on, the kind of pathway we chose. We decided that we should bring in more foreigners into the country to do development on our land. The government's push, people from outside push, and a narrative that drive to us is that your land does not have value unless and until you register it or you give it away. We in the organization say no, because the value of it, from our perspective, cannot be measured in monetary terms. You just imagine the land that we hold now, we don't own it, but we hold it in custody for our children and our children's children down the line. And you can just imagine if one generation decides to give the land away. Man, that's, that's genocide for the next generation to come. So part of the campaign that we hold here is that, or within our customary land campaign is we promote it. You can be successful businessmen and women on your own land. It is the role of the government to facilitate development to go and reach people. The extension services that are supposed to go to cocoa and coffee growers in the village, the infrastructure, the market most importantly. It is the role of the government, the government to facilitate it for the people. So the people don't have to give away their land. So they can become very successful businessmen and women. The typical example we just, you know, currently seeing now happening in Weebeck, for example, the cocoa growers, the prices have increased. And these are smallholders, these are landowners who are planting cocoa on their own land. They're making millions out of it. You look at the ones in Buka now, they're also doing the same. This is the kind of model we should be promoting. Uh, the government has recently established the Lands Commission. How encouraging is, to, is it to have such an institution in place? We had in the past numerous institutions set up by government with good intent, I must say, to protect the interest of the state. But also, the people's interest has to be captured in there as well too. The interest has to be protected. We have seen numerous scams created in the past where it was created by the government. And we have seen numerous customary lands being freed up and given away to foreigners. I'll lead you to one example, which is the Special Agriculture Business Lease. That was created by the government back then for um, agriculture companies to come in and establish agriculture. But then lands were to be taken away from the people. And most of these lands were leased out for 99 years to foreigners. That made Papua New Guineans landless. That eventually ended up in a commission of inquiry, which found out that that scam was illegal and ordered or recommended that most of these lands be given away, back or given back to, the Papua, to Papua New Guineans, rightful owners. That saw 5 million hectares of customary land all throughout Papua New Guinea. 
it's as big as Oro Province and Central Province put together. That's a good intent. That maybe has a good intent. But as I said earlier on, people's interest have to be at the center of it. It is not about the government trying to create institutions with the intent to take away land from Papua New Guineans. Because also me talk business, as I said earlier on, land is our livelihood. It is basically everything to us because, you know, when you decide to take away land, maybe with the intent for development, but development for who? Thank you, Eddie. We now go for a quick break. When we return, we look at the models of development in PNG. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Now, Eddie, one of your core areas of campaign is the model of development. You mentioned that the resource extraction, foreign ownership, and un unrestrained capitalism are promoted as a model of development, but provide very little benefit for ordinary people. What would you attribute such a trend to? Now, that's a really good question, because I would go back to what we had discussed on earlier on, is that, you know, in the beginning, our forefathers had actually had created a model already, which was, I view it as homegrown, something that was built on what we were already a built-in sort of, we, as Papua New Guineans, we were already in tune to. After independence coming down, we decided to open our doors to outsiders. We wanted to be part of the global community. Um, and with the thinking that export-driven economy would be one that would drive our economy. They get exposed us to this model of the unrestrained capitalism. And that's basically profit-making. Now, for a country uh, in Papua New Guinea, and especially in the region that is so resource-rich, we're supposed to be better off by now. We're supposed to be better off maybe more than Dubai. We're supposed to have more foreign reserves. We're supposed to have, we're not supposed to be complaining about smaller things. We're supposed to be looking at bigger things. If you look at it now, the majority of our Papua New Guineans, 85% of the population, or even more, are based in the village. Every time when there is this promise of a new development project that's coming in, some of the phrases and the common ones that are always used is that it will improve the GDP of the country. It will create employment. These are favorite terms that are used by developers. These are terms that are used by governments who are speaking on behalf of the foreigners. I remember when we had APEC in 2018, and we had numerous leaders who came out defending the hosting of APEC because we were pouring in millions to put a really good mat and to put some fancy vehicles there for our foreign leaders to come, to come and drive in. And some of us were really getting on it, saying that, you know, look, we had very dire education and health services, which the money would have been spent on. Now we are looking at trying to host a fancy APEC. And many came out swinging, saying, you know, look, it's going to create employment. We are trying to be friends to everybody. We are trying to create, you know, partnership, business partnership. It's for the good of the country. Where is that going? We had signing of numerous agreements that we had. And we come out saying that it will increase the GDP. You look at the GDP. What is a GDP in economic terms? It's only a measure of those who are living in towns and cities. How about the mother of the Papua New Guineans who are living in the, in the villages? Is that a good measure of economic development and growth for a country? It doesn't even make sense. We keep on doing the same thing. We keep on repeating the same promises to our Papua New Guineans Yet there is really nothing to show for. It is really time for us to sit down and to really look at our development path and to really ask the tough questions. If it means for us to say no, we say no. Because that is for the good of our country. 
that is for the good of our people. That is, good for, that is for the good of our generations. We cannot just sit down and for and say, yes, 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 master and stay. We should be really asking tough questions. We should be really looking at our development path. Where have we gone wrong? What has happened? What are the main causes that are stopping things, services from reaching the majority of Papua New Guineans who are rural-based? It's really time now we should start. We are reaching 50. It's a good segue into our next question. And ECNOW has identified and asserted what it claims as misconceptions or false claims regarding development. A notable example would be that, and I quote, rural people do not live in poverty. Most people in PNG have access to all the basics of life, food, water, shelter, family, and community. They also have small cash incomes and enjoy many basic freedoms. What communities lack is a decent government that provides quality health and education services. Would you agree that the Western characterization of poverty is not entirely applicable in certain societies like Papua New Guinea? It comes to, it's defined separately and looked at it separately in different contexts. And I think for Papua New Guinea, we think that, and we would agree that Western characterization of poverty is, is not entirely applicable in Papua New Guinea. And this is because most people in the West are landless. While in Papua New Guinea, most of us, um, as soon as you are born, Mama Karim, you as soon as you come out of your mother's womb, you, are, you have the bad right to a land, to a group, to a land owning clan, whether you be a, a female or a male. So as long as communities retain control of their land and they have access to food and shelter and can maintain their traditional practices and customs, that in itself is self-sustainable. So yes, the Western characterization of poverty um, is not entirely applicable in the circumstances that we have. And I think, you know, we have institutions like the, <clears throat> excuse me, like the World Bank and the others that, you know, they characterize poverty as those that live under $2 a day, uh, live in the state of poverty. It should be seen in different circumstances. And for Papua New Guineans, you know, and I always say that, you know, all of us have land. If you claim that you don't land, then you are a lazy person. Thank you, Eddie. We now go for a quick break. When we return, we look at the issue of deep sea mining. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Still in the studio with me is Eddie Tanago, campaign manager for Act Now. Now, Eddie, given the transition of the global economy into the green economy, where the Demand for minerals like copper, cobalt, and nickel are in need for renewable energy technology. Extensive reserves are found within the sea floors. What is ECNAO's position on the seabed mining in PNG and around the Pacific? Seabed mining was one of our, is still one of our main campaigns that we have. And we are totally against the idea. It's a technology not even known all around the world. It's something new for us. It's never been tested anywhere all around the world. Our government has decided to go and get a loan from BSP to be part of a test, I must say. And Papua New Guineans, all of us are still paying, repaying the tax that we got from a failed project. It is quite devastating for a technology that never been tested in the waters of anywhere around the world. And I don't know, for some reason, our government has decided to buy into the idea and has only bought stake into this failed project. Now, <clears throat> we have this Solwara one that's currently, the license is still active. I hear, I read about in the media that there is a potential company that's gonna come and take off the license to, to mine or to continue mine the seabed. It is, it is quite worrying for me that, you know, as a country, we cannot manage terrestrial mining or mining low ground. We cannot manage, we don't have the capacity to manage mining on the land. What's gonna happen 
when there is mining in the sea, how are we going to monitor it, the impacts especially? Are we going to just be there and be told by scientists from the company that, you know, look, it doesn't have any impact? We on, are we going to just depend on the company's reports that they produce to us? Look at Pogera. Look at the dying fly. Look at Misima. There's a hole in there. You don't need a scientist to come and tell you what's going to happen. That's a disaster. That is basically a disaster for Papua New Guinea and for the whole Pacific because they have interest all around the Pacific. And for Papua New Guineans, there's only Solwara One. The whole seabed in the Bismarck and all around is all prospected already. Who knows? And the government has to be really, really careful about it because, you know, something coming into Solwara, there is no control over the tide. What guarantee is that, you know, you're going to be mining with remote control? What's the guarantee that the host will not burst out? Are you going to control the tide under the sea? There is not even a study done to find out especially what's being, what's done under the sea or what's been there, what's, what's under the sea, 1,200, 1,600 meters below the sea level. So the life in there is also unknown to the outside world, and even to the technology itself too. So our position has been that, to know, it's not supposed to be a model we should be following and to be trying to be part of the world, given the, the demand we have. We have so many mines already that's currently in operation. Why do you want to go under the sea? That's crazy. Now, Eddie, you've recently launched the DD District Development Authority Watch website. How has it performed so far? We as an organization have launched or built and uh, developed and built a, a, watch call, a website called DDA Watch. Um, that is under our corruption campaign. DDA Watch, or DDA Watch actually uh, created by the government in 2014 uh, with the intent to provide basic health and education services to the rural majority and to provide the presence of the government back to the people. And on that note, I always see it as a, as a good intent. That's decentralization of powers, both politically and economically. Um, even though there are, you know, a disadvantages of having that kind of system in place. There has been, since 2014, 10 million kina has been given to each of its DDAs. We have, have about 96 districts all throughout the country. So there's been a lot of money given with little to so for. When I say that, it means there is no transparency, there is no accountability of how these monies have been spent. So reading so much about it, hearing so, so much about it, we thought that maybe we should come up with a, a platform um, to promote greater transparency and accountability. So we, we, we developed and we built this website called DDA Watch, which we launched in June of 2023. Currently, it's performing really well, um, even though we had a lot of setbacks as well too. The website itself is, is built with the intent to be as an information hub for researchers, for journalists, for constituents, for any other person who has interest in each, each of the districts, about 96 districts. The information regarding each one of them. In the website, in each of the landing pages for each of the districts, we wanted to make sure that the five-year plans are uploaded there, their budget is uploaded there, their financial reports, acquittals and audit reports, the inspection reports are put up there. We also wanted to make sure that the names of the district CEOs are also online. We also wanted to put their phone numbers and emails and their physical address. These people or these officers or most of them, you hardly, you hardly see them around. And these documents too are, are hidden 
where people do not know, and, and most of them are written in very technical or technical English, where even though the documents are intended for the village people, of small people on the ground, but it's really, really hard to understand. One of the main challenges we faced as an organization of trying to make sure that these documents are available is having accessible to it. We are working very closely with the relevant government departments to make sure to collect all the documents to have it available. Unfortunately, there's not many available. So if you go online and you see that there is nothing, anything on your, on your district, that means that there is nothing. Even though we have districts who have launched their websites, uh, launched their five-year plans, but we can't grab hold of it onto them. We have tried to write letters to each of the districts and have it presented at the, the pigeon holes in the parliament. We have not gotten any responses at all. So right now we only have about a few that are available and that we have online. The website itself too has a rating where you can actually um, you go to the website and in the front page, the home page, you will see that there are the first five um, DDAs that are available there. Why? Most times, uh, we had already had complaints coming in from uh, constituents and from even local MPs themselves saying that um, the information provided there are wrong. But I want to say this and I want to make it clear that the rating is not reflective of how well you as an MP or your MP is performing on the ground. It's based on the key transparency and accountability documents that, as I mentioned earlier on, the five-year plan. The five-year plan is the five-year cycle of the elected MP at the time. So if you are to wait, that should be one of your priorities as soon as you get into office is to come up with a plan. Some do not have this. Some have just launched this recently. We have the election coming up in 2027. You may be performing really well, but after all, you're gonna report on what you have performed on. So what are you gonna report on? Are you gonna just report out of the blue? You have to report according to what you plan to do, according to what you have budgeted for. You cannot just go and operate out of the blue. There's a system in place to ensure transparency and accountability. So if you as an MP or as, a, as, a, as the constitution who have you know, reservations against the rating systems that we have, as I said, it's not about how well your MP is performing. It's based on these key documents that I've, I've mentioned. Mr. Eddie Tanago, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Well, viewers, that ends this edition of In Focus. Do join us again next week, Monday, on our regular time slot of 7 p.m. Till then, bye for now. This program was proudly brought to you by Telecom Limited and Daytap.